met her in the fall. He took her to a movie, and when they done it all, he took her. To Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer, and this week our special guest is the master of filmic fantasy, Terry Gilliam, and he'll be joining us to talk about his mind-blowing new film, The Imaginarium of Dr. Panassi. When Heath Ledger tragically died halfway through filming... Oh, late, late for a very important date. Terry Gilliam found salvation... <laughs> ...through the looking glass. By Hollywood standards, Gilliam's unique, but don't call him an anomaly. It's the problem is you've got to say Anne before you say anomaly, an anomaly. Also on the show... <laughs> ...a hit film about accordion wars... <laughs> now that's an anomaly. But first, near, far, wherever you are, you probably have seen James Cameron's Titanic. And you probably remember that hit monster soundtrack by composer James Horner. Well, with the long-awaited avatar, James and James are at it again. In Avatar, a tooled-up human army travels to a distant planet to wipe out the locals and steal their land. We have an indigenous population of humanoids called the Na'vi. They are very hard to kill. Visual awesomeness is guaranteed, but Jim Cameron also needed Avatar to work on an emotional level. Naughty. 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 And the most powerful tool for evoking emotion... <laughs> ...it's music. The emotional quality of the film is really brought out with the music. It's really first and foremost an emotional film and then the hardware stuff on the surface there is the military aspect which comes across very clearly and plays very well on its own it doesn't need a lot of help you're on pandora ladies and gentlemen respect that fact then underneath the surface there's the whole indigenous culture and the sort of um, spiritual culture of the film that really only comes across with music. We did not want, um, you know, the electronic, you know, futuristic sounds that are often associated with, uh, you know, science fiction movies. We wanted. James to, to, to use strings and to use woodwinds and to, to incorporate that as, as the big bass and drums. Drums had a big, big part in, in, in the score for, for Jim Cameron um, because of what it re represents from the Navi people. How important was the music to Cameron? Well, usually a composer is brought in near the end of the edit, but with Avatar, Horner was involved for three years. I play him sequence after sequence after sequence, so he gets a sense of the flow. Their voices, um, several different types of choirs. There are a lot of instruments and small ensembles that I invented digitally because I could never find real instruments that did the trick. And I wanted it to sound like something I had never heard before. The process couldn't have been more different with their deadline-defying first collaboration. Oh. Aliens. We had very little time and I was just working as fast as I could to what he was giving me. What came out, came out, and it's just um, one of those things of history. I'm glad it came out as well as it did. There's a book, Jack. Their next dance was Titanic. Jack. I think the music led the audience there as much as the visuals. During the sinking, you really had a sense of loss, and I think he created that musically um, you know, where we could not take the time to do it narratively. Horner's Titanic soundtrack sold over 30 million copies. Will the soundtrack to Avatar duplicate this success?
At this point, it remains to be seen. This year at Cannes, a little Colombian film with a very unusual storyline was met with a boisterous standing ovation. It's about an aging accordion player who's kind of like a rock star. Well, never try to judge me, dude. You don't know what the f I've been through. But I know something about you. You went to Cranbrook. That's a private school. If you think such verbal violence is confined to rap music, <laughs> think again, amigo. <laughs> The Wind Journeys from Colombia is that rare and surprising film. That's even better than you might expect. This is the story of a man who has uh, played his accordion all his life, uh, carrying songs from village to village in the northern part of Colombia. One day he decides he won't play anymore. Uh, and he starts a journey to the edge of the country, the northern edge of Colombia, to give back his accordion and never play it again. Accordionist Marciano Martinez is a real-life juglar, or traveling minstrel, playing the popular Colombian folk music called Vallenato. La gente dice que yo soy de la nueva generación. People say I am the last juglar left of the Vallenato. <laughs> I've been in many competitions. I like to compete, to demonstrate my superiority. This is a legendary instrument that is said to be cursed because it once belonged to the devil. And uh, on the way he is joined by a very young man who wishes to, to be a musician, to learn the secret of music from him. Hey! They're like counterpoints. The boy wants to learn from him, but the master never wants to teach. It's a master-apprentice relationship that's sometimes beautiful, sometimes ugly. The Wind Journeys is a window on a seldom-seen side of Colombia. In Colombia, is, is, is 67 languages are spoken, but only, but never has been there been a Colombian film that's uh, in another language different from Spanish. So yeah, it's 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 trying to to be to show a, a new country, a different country that is very different from the country that people know through the media. <laughs> And with the wind journey storming the film festival circuit. Soy un hombre competente. Lo he sido desde muy niño. Marciano, the rock star, is getting his second win. Canto un verso con cariño para complacer mi gente. In part two, we're joined by the writer, director, and visionary Terry Gilliam. We'll be talking about his latest creation, The Imaginarium of Dr. Panassas. Now, that is also a film that will be remembered as the final performance of the late great actor Heath Ledger, and it's also utterly brilliant. Hope you join us for part two. He met her in the fall. Hi, everybody. Can I please introduce the inspiring Terry Gilliam and the special screening of the Imaginarium of Dr. Panassas. <laughs> this is an extraordinary film and dedicated to somebody, some very special people. The whole experience was so extraordinary. It was, it was amazing. And in the end, the cast all gathered one night and said, what are we going to call this thing? And we said, it's going to be a film from Heath Ledger and Friends. Yeah. I was going to make it a co-directing film with Terry Gilliam and Heath Ledger, because <laughs> both live and dead, he managed to direct a lot of this film in a strange way. Sixty-nine-year-old director Terry Gilliam is famous for two things, his wild imagination and the mounting suspicion that he's been cursed. No, good luck. <laughs> 
In the Imaginarium of Dr. Panassis, a devil grants Panassis, played by Christopher Plummer, eternal life, but at a price. You're probably not a betting man, are you? It's classic Gilliam, but it will forever be notorious as Heath Ledger's final film. Can you put a price on your dreams? Ledger, just 28, died of an accidental prescription drug overdose midway through production. Gilliam shot Ledger's remaining scenes with a trio of replacements, Johnny Depp, Colin Farrell and Jude Law. What are you doing? Trying to save your daughter's life, sir! The Hollywood stars helped save his film, but Gilliam makes no bargains with the Hollywood devil. He always does his own thing. I grew up outside of Hollywood, and I couldn't see working my way up through the system, and so I developed a deep dislike <laughs> for the system. Gilliam kicked off his career as an animator for the famed Monty Python comedy troupe. And suddenly, the animator suffered a fatal heart attack. That madness and that silliness and that anarchism and the lack of authority, uh, sense of authority, these are all important things, so they never leave me. I mean, I think my films have gotten... It's been a, a kind of a path away from Python. Right! Show! I like just breaking things open to see what's inside of things. It's, it's <laughs> Time Bandits, a time-traveling fairy tale following dwarves through history, was Gilliam's first post-Python success. <laughs> then came Brazil, a futuristic fantasy of a society so hysterical over crime and terrorism, it resorts to absurdly intrusive security measures. Unbelievable. Where are you taking him? <laughs> there. Drugs! What'd they give you? Thorzy? How dog? How much? How much? His apocalyptic sci-fi 12 Monkeys with Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt remains his most successful film to date. I'm not saying you're not mentally ill. All for all I know, you're <laughs> crazy as a loon. But that's not why you're here. That's not why you're here. It's not why you're here. You're here because of the system. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas featured Johnny Depp as gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson. That was headquarters. They want me to... <laughs> The Gonzo approach is that you you don't stand back and objectify things, you leap in. And that's what I do as a filmmaker. Whatever I do, I'm consumed by the project and it takes over my life. And it might destroy it, it might save it, and I will do anything to get it made uh, honestly or the way I think it should be made. In 1999, Gilliam embarked on The Man Who Killed Don Quixote with Johnny Depp. I suspect there's a uh, large uh, bunch of lightning and a storm about to hit us. But a series of calamities doomed the production. A behind-the-scenes documentary popularised the curse of Gilliam. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? And with the triumph and tragedy behind Dr Panassas, the bittersweet Terry Gilliam tradition continues. Voila. Oh, voila. There was a point in the January 2008 where you could have made the decision not to make this film. What, what kept you going? I don't know. Madness, stupidity, my daughter, uh, my cinematographer, Nicola Pecorini. Uh, most of the people involved in the film said there's no way you're going to walk away from this. I was ready to just give up, obviously, because I couldn't see a way of finishing the film. I thought this is the one they finally, the big boy upstairs finally nailed me. This is exciting. This is fun. There are so many temptations. Maybe just a peek. Turning. I've heard you say this in interviews before that people have said you, you've got unlucky with Don Quixote. But you've often countered that and said, well, actually, it's the opposite. I've been incredibly lucky. I mean, what you have done is you have managed to have four actors play the one character. Something that you didn't set out to do, but you have done. Once we made the leap that your face could change on the other side of the mirror, you could be part of somebody else's imagination, boom, we were free, and then it was just a matter of getting three A-list movie actors who happened to be free. <laughs> Thank you. Who are you, dear? How difficult was it to buoy people up again to get them enthused and encouraged to carry on working. Uh, it's, it's, it's very hard. I mean, when, because literally we finished shooting here in London on a Saturday night. We had a week's prep before everybody had to turn up for shooting in, in Vancouver. And on the Tuesday, he was, he was dead. And we just completely collapsed. Everybody did. And uh, it took 
I don't know. It was a few days before there was a, even the, the thought that we could actually finish the film. Because, to be honest, this has never happened where a lead actor dies midway through and the film gets finished. And the first person I called was Johnny, because Johnny was a good friend of Heath. And I said, I don't know what we're doing, but can you help? And he says, I'm there. Whatever you want, I'm there. Done. It was like we were on autopilot, to be honest, because it's a, it was a good thing because it's better to be working when you're grieving than not working. You must concentrate tonight. Everything depends on it. The trick is to make sure when you're making any film now, make sure there's a magic mirror in it <laughs> that people can go through <laughs> and their faces can change. I mean, it wasn't planned. It was so bizarre that Heath had basically completed uh, almost all of his work um, on this side of the mirror before he died. Now maybe it's just things ought to be done a little different. Yeah. What different uh, sort of way Morning, do you suggest? Sir. Morning, yeah. how you doing? How was your sleep last night? Right. You know, I saw you had a nasty yeah. bump on your head. Different, what do you mean? He had that quality that was incredibly dignified and so funny. What we saw was just the tip of the iceberg. The potential was endless. There was nothing he couldn't do. I mean, he'd be outrageously funny, he could be silly, he could be tragic, you know, he'd wait to him. He never cheated. He never just did things for a cheap laugh. It was all solid. I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. It would have been the best, I think. I keep saying this, but I do believe it. And what about the mirror? What, uh, what's that about, hey? Eh? A bit of hocus pocus? Oh, no, mate, you know, Tony, 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 you don't get it, man. It is... It's impossible to describe. It is, it's, it's, it's mystery. Yeah. That's one of the great beauties of this film for me, him and Andrew Garnfield. Oh, he and Andrew were a, a brilliant team. When we started rehearsals, Heath just went into character as Tony. And poor Andrew was at a, at a loss because Heath was his buddy. They were friends and suddenly this monster appears and Andrew just didn't know how to deal with it. But we did, I said, Andrew, your character Anton believes in magic. He's sort of a fantasist. So learn to laugh, learn to be magical. And the two of them were just firing, it was brilliant. Why bother with this little, uh Sideshow act. Not a sideshow. You don't, you, don't, you don't want to rule the world. He wants the world to rule itself. Was there, was there a conscious thing where you have humanity descending into a sort of Greek pre-Christian um, oh. Warner Brothers? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of religious nonsense in there. It's, uh, I mean, we tried that in Fear and Loathing about with uh, the scene, I don't know if those of you have seen it, Adrenochrome, where there's this drug and Johnny's taking it and going crazy, and, and Benicio is a pagan. One's a pagan, one's a Christian. So those ideas have always played around. I mean, I, I find I've always been fascinated by particularly Catholic imagery, and there's always a sense of punishment in the film. And that's, I think, started with Brazil, and, uh, you know, the character of Jonathan Price plays is a privileged character and yet he's not taking responsibility for his position and that's always been something that is probably me whipping myself because of all the things that you know, are wrong with the world that I'm not involved in. One of my favourite films of yours is um, Twelve Monkeys. Thank you. And you, you know, plucked a Brad Pitt, who was doing quite well. He was doing Legends of the Fall, I think, around that time. But he wasn't as big at that point. You managed to, to get him at a good time. No, we got him at the moment, just after Legends of the Fall came out. And he rocketed from a nice guy he could go to dinner with and walk around the streets of Philadelphia to a guy who couldn't move outside of his apartment. Girls were threatening to throw themselves out of windows if he appeared. We had to suddenly hire all these security people. It was like a nightmare. The whole shoot became a security operation. But you didn't pay him as no, much. No, didn't pay him much. No, good, no. Good. Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. We don't pay. We, we give people <laughs> chances to show what they're really, how talented they really are. Which you've done. And it's best when they work for less money because they feel less like a whore. <laughs> so Bruce Willis worked for less money too. No, Bruce worked for scale. I'd met him before and I liked him, so I came to New York and said, Bruce, if you want to be in this movie, I don't want Bruce Willis Superstar on, on board. I want Bruce Willis the actor. And you've got to come with nothing. No entourage. Basically, you come naked into this thing. And it made such a difference because the day we realized what a difference it had made was there was a weekend that he had to go and shoot some extra shots for one of the Die Hard movies. And he came back a completely different man because he was getting paid $20 million, and he behaved as one does when you get paid that money. Oh, he just became an asshole. That's what you do. He became a 
And he came back, and it took us a couple of days before he came back to our movie and Bruce Willis, the actor. I can't wait to edit this Q&A. This is going to be great. I know. Fun. Well, that'd be fun. <laughs> I want to stay here this time. Where do you derive your dark humour from? And I must tell you, because my, my father's an Englishman and, and one of the first films he made me watch was The Holy Grail. So I could just get in touch with his spirituality. Yes, it was a spiritual film, wasn't it? Yeah. Jesus Christ! I just think the world is a very funny place. And, it, and if you aren't able to enjoy just the absurdity of most of life, then you're just going to get old and die young. Uh, no, that's... <laughs> It's, I, I, it's, that's a theory of mine. Um, it's that death doesn't like laughter. So the more you can find things to laugh at, especially death, um, the more he stays at bay. I mean, I'm 932 years old. That's the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> you are Dr. Panassas. <laughs> you really are. Can we thank Dr. Panassas or his alter ego, Terry Gilliam, here for joining us on the Fabulous Picture Show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Forgive me, but I, I, I have a couple of solutions to your problems. One, I was thinking of, you know, changing the style of the show. And two, I would um, change the audience, perhaps. Change? Yeah. yeah you know, uh, but in, in my opinion, I'd change both. But, you know, that's just me. And I'd... Change the show? Who the friggin' hell do you think you are? Well, that's the end of the Fabulous Picture Show. You're a bit of a giggler, aren't you? Giggling is important. That's very yeah. important. Mike Palin, Terry Jones, and I were the gigglers in the Pythons, and we were normal-sized people. The others were much taller, and they didn't giggle. And we had more fun. Thank you for making me giggle. You know what's going to go on my gravestone? What? I was going to say Terry Gilliam. He giggled in awe. Your friend is about to have a life-changing experience. We got a customer. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate this film and why? On my personal scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably say that this is a 9. I think it's the best thing that Gilliam's done. It's different. It's a really magical experience. The way in which he uses CGI to transmit what's been going on in his mind, it's just it was really, really refreshing. Brilliant. A Lily Cole was, was awesome. Here are the three sentences I'd use to recommend this film to my friends. One, here's your ticket. Two, you owe me a tenner. Three, don't be late. Mm -hmm.